Hi, everyone. Uh, this is the Maintaining Your meta, uh, Metadata webinar. Um, we've got some people still signing in, so um, we'll get started in another minute. I've put up a short poll. Uh, if you know, while we're waiting for it to get started, if you don't mind, just go ahead and fill that out. It's just a casual poll. It gives us a little bit of information about uh, what you're trying to gain, gain from this webinar today. All right, um, let's get started. Um, I'm going to end the poll in a second, but just some housekeeping before we really get started. Um, we'll be sending out the slides and a recording of the webinar shortly after we're finished. Um, the audio, your audio phones and uh, audio are muted, um, so you can't ask questions directly, but there is a questions, a Q&A option. Uh, at the bottom of your screen. So if you have a question during the webinar, please feel free to enter your question and I'll try to um, answer them as we go along. And if I don't get to your questions, we'll do a little catch up at the end. So the focus of this webinar is maintaining your metadata. We'll touch briefly on what metadata we collect at Crossref and then we'll describe how you can add to, update and evaluate your metadata. We won't be covering how to initially register metadata. That's covered in another webinar. All right. So when you register your content with us, you create a metadata record for that content. The record, as with most metadata, describes content in detail. The level of detail is really up to you, but a record must contain uh, basic bibliographic metadata like author names, ORCID IDs, affiliations, article titles, ISSN, ISBN, page issue, volume, dates, um, any internal identifiers, um, that you may use, the, and of course the URL of, of the item, and uh, of course the Crossref DOI. Um, so those are all, that's important bibliographic information. We really, we require a title, we require a publication date, um, but the rest is all just as important. We just don't require it because we realize it's not completely relevant or available for all um, metadata that you submit to us. We collect a lot of other metadata as well. It's not traditional bibliographic metadata, but it can be just as important for describing your content and where it sits in relation to other scholarly objects. So we collect um, information about where you archive your content. Uh, we have a free to read tag for open access content. We collect reference lists so you can uh, see, participate in our site advice service and see who is citing your content. We can, we collect funding data, license data, um, clinical, clinical trial numbers, if that's relevant for your content. Uh, we collect information about errata, retractions, and updates through our cross -ref, through our Crossmark service. And we're also collecting uh, explicit relationships between items more and more. Together, it all adds up to a complete metadata record. It's not easy to gather and send along all of this metadata, and we understand that. Um, that's the reason we only really require bibliographic metadata, but a complete record will have all of the above, and it'll help place your content on a scholarly map, map and make it more discoverable and more useful. So if you've in the past omitted or fudged some of the data you sent to us, it, it, it's okay. I'm going to go into how to update your existing records with corrections and enhancements. When you create a record with this, the most persistent part is the identify you register, the DOI. 
Um, the rest of the record can be updated and ex expanded continuously. Again, we do make a distinction between bibliographic and other metadata. Um, and it, again, it's all important. But when you create a metadata record, um, you must include the bibliographic metadata and identifiers when your content is initially registered. Um, you can you include, include a comprehensive amount of metadata, so everything we collect in your initial registration, but most non-bibliographic metadata can be added post-registration as you are able without resubmitting everything you've sent to us, and I'll get to that in a second. Um, as I mentioned, bibliographic metadata includes basic citation metadata, um, that some, anything that would be used in citing an item. It may also include orchids for authors as well as JATS formatted abstracts. Um, this metadata is used specifically to identify the items being registered. It is also distributed to third parties and is used to look up your DOIs so that people can link to your content. So it's important that this metadata record is clean and complete. Um, we can't really create a decent metadata record without uh, you sending us the good metadata. So as for content, uh, types of metadata that you can add to your record, um, this includes all of the items listed here on this slide. Um, we get a lot of reference lists added to metadata records after they've been initially registered. Um, if you decide that you want to distribute your funding data, information about who's funding your research outputs and uh, what the grant numbers are, that sort of thing, you can include that. Uh, you can attach um, component records. Uh, those are kind of supplemental material, material metadata records. You can attach those to your uh, journal articles and book chapters. Um, and, you can also include the text and data mining URLs, relationship be between DOIs and other identifiers. You can also include any URLs you want to supply if you participate in our multiple resolution service. So this means you can create a record for a journal article, for example, that just contains the basics. You decide to participate in our site advice service, so you can submit just the reference list to be added to your metadata record once that DOI and metadata record have been registered. You then decide, once you've been with Crossref for a little longer, you decide you want to participate in Crossmark. So you can submit your Crossmark data in a separate update. You can do the same with funding, license data, etc. cetera. Um, this works particularly well if you partner with vendors to provide funding information, or if, for example, your platform that you use doesn't support reference deposits and you want to do that on your own. We do have some um, kind of manual tools you can use to add add references to your um, metadata records. The same with license and funding data. You can actually upload that using a CSV file, which I'll get to in a little bit. It's also important to add, uh, for me to mention, that you can add this metadata as often as needed without incurring any additional fees. With the exception of our Crossmark metadata, um, updating, re updating a record doesn't cost you anything. We charge a one-time deposit fee when a record is initially registered. We also charge a one-time per record crossmark fee when the crossmark data is initially added, but we don't charge for metadata updates or crossmark updates once that they've been added to our uh, records. If you've discovered errors in your metadata or otherwise need to make an update, you'll need to redeposit your metadata with the changes included. Any metadata already in our system will be overwritten, so make sure you send us everything, uh, particularly when updating bibliographic metadata. For example, if you deposit your DOIs with an online publication date before the item has been published in print, you can then update the metadata once the print information is available. Um, but you will, if you want to retain the online publication date, when you send in the update, you need to include both the online publication date and the print publication date in the update. The data that can be submitted using a resource deposit doesn't need to be included when only core metadata is updated, um, but within each resource type, you do need to submit the complete resource data. It can get a little confusing. Um, 
So just for example, if you've discovered you've left out a grant number from your funding information for a journal article you've registered, you can submit just the funding data in an update. But in that update, you do need to include all the funding data for that item, not just the item, the, the single funder information that you're updating. So if you've got three funders that you're submitting for an article, when you send in an update, you have, need to include metadata for all three funders. We're not appending extra information to existing fund, funding metadata. URLs are a bit special. Um, they're a bit of a special case. Um, you can update your URLs by resubmitting the bibliographic portion of your metadata record with a new URL, or you can send us a list of DOIs and URLs and we'll update them for you. And so that would just be a tab separated list of DOIs and URLs. You can send that using an email um, to our support team at support at crossref.org. If you need to remove metadata from a record, um, you can't really remove all top level bibliographic metadata. Um, that's only really necessary if something has gone wrong. Um, if you've registered something by mistake, you've registered the wrong DOI for the wrong item. Um, in that case, you would need to overwrite um, that metadata with non-descriptive metadata. Um, you're, you should really, um, touch base with us before you do that. So I'm not going to go into detail um, on how to do that. Um, if it's something you need to do on a recurring basis, we should definitely have a conversation about uh, why, this, why this needs to happen. But if you need to remove a single piece of bibliographic metadata, let's say uh, you realize you've submitted a print publication date for an online only journal uh, for some reason, you can remove that piece by resubmitting your metadata with the print publication date omitted. Because we allow you to up your update your resource metadata in segments, we require that you be very explicit when you remove resource metadata from your record. We require that you submit an empty top level tag to remove a segment of resource metadata. So for example, to remove all crossmark metadata, you need to submit a metadata or resource XML file with a closed crossmark tag as you see on this slide. So a closed crossmark tag removes all crossmark data, the um, program name equals fund draft tag um, removes all funding metadata. Um, and in these slides, at the end of the slides, um, when we send them out, there is a list of resources and a link, link to some documentation on more uh, specific information on how to do all of this stuff I'm describing to you. Um, so, you know, if, if you do have want to learn further about, about that, you can just uh, take a look at the slides when they're sent around. If you decide to do a big update of your metadata, there are some things to keep in mind. Um, sending us a large amount of files, it's usually okay, depending on your definition of large. So if you're sending um, hundreds of thousands of updates, you might want to coordinate that with us. Um, we only allow 10,000 files per user in our submission queue. Um, so if you have more than 10,000 files to send us, you'll need to send them in batches and pay attention to our submission queue to make sure that you're not exceeding that 10,000 file limit. If you do exceed it, um, anything over 10,000 will get, I believe it's a 503 error when you submit it to us. Um, I also want to note that the time spent to process a file depends on what's in it. Um, it's important to know when your timing updates. So for some items, we really just write data to our database and it's updated quickly. That's for say a basic metadata update. Um, for other items, we have to do a little bit more. Um, if you are submitting references, um, we need to check to see if we have a match for each citation, which can take some time. And it actually takes more time depending on what kind of citation it is. If it's a marked up journal citation, that doesn't take a lot of time. If it's an unstructured citation for um, a website, well, we're, our internal processes are going to try to maybe take pick that metadata apart and see what we can do with it. That might take a little more time. Um, if you submit funding data, we also do some matching of funders to funder identifiers. 
um, that will add to the overall processing time, but hopefully not too much. It's just something to keep in mind, you know, if you send in registered 10,000 metadata records and it takes an hour, um, that's going, it's going to be a different experience if you come along and add a list of references to all of those 10,000 articles. That's probably going to take three times as much time. Hey, someone's asked um, if I could uh, talk more about Crossmark. Um, I'll just briefly uh, explain what Crossmark is. It's a service where um, members can send us uh, metadata about updates, corrections, retractions, and that metadata can be displayed on their website. So a user can, we've got a little Crossmark wi widget that's displayed on, that you can embed in your journal article page. So a user can click on that widget and see if an article has updates, if an article has um, retractions. You can also include information, custom information, like what your peer review process is, that sort of thing. So if you're interested in that, we do have, a, we do a regular series of webinars on Crossmark and there's a lot of information on our website about that. So we'll move on to evaluating your metadata, which can act, be a bit tr tricky. Um, we have some plans in place to make it much easier for you to see at a glance where your problem areas are, uh, but they aren't in place yet and there's still a lot that can be done right now. Um, so I'm going to walk you through some basics. With, we'll start with how to view the metadata you've registered with us. If you want to easily eyeball your basic metadata, you can do so using our metadata search interface. It presents a segment of the metadata, not everything, but it lets you know um, some really basic information. It's a good way to check to see if you're working with a vendor, just to see if something's been registered. Um, you can search by DOI or by ISSN article title author. It's a free text search, so you can search for your journal title or ISSN and see what is um, showing up if you just want to you know, check and see to make sure everything's being registered. Um, so in this example, um, I, I looked up this metadata record for a specific DOI. There's an encoding issue in the article title. It really jumps out at you when you look at it in this user interface. Uh, you see the diamond question mark. Um, other common things to look for are whether the author information is complete and correct. We have a lot of authors who use this tool for various reasons, and they're constantly contacting us to complain about issues with their names in um, publisher metadata. The spellings, they're in the wrong order, they're missing entirely. It causes them a lot of problems when they try to claim credit for their work. We also have a fairly robust REST API. It's publicly available. It can be used to retrieve or interrogate your metadata. It displays most of the metadata you've registered, a well, pretty much all of it at this point, um, with the exception of references, which are not included unless you have opted to make them public. Um, by default, references are not distributed to the public, but you can opt to make them public. Um, if you'd like to do so, uh, just as, as a side note, please contact Crafts Ref Support and we'll tell you how to make that happen. If you wanna make want more information about that, you can contact us as, about that as well. Um, you can use the REST API to retrieve all metadata for your pre prefixes or to retrieve it DOI by DOI, as um, I've got examples of both of those sorts of queries here. And here's an example of the type of record you can get from our REST API. The results are in JSON and will, again, include uh, the metadata you've registered with us. You can do the use the REST API to do some basic troubleshooting as well, even if you're not an API person. Um, here's an example query that will show you the total number of DOIs registered for a prefix. So that's a simple way to see if the numbers we have match up with what you have. Um, with, of course, the caveat that the REST API is indexed fairly quickly, but not instantaneously. So if you've just registered something, you may want to wait until the next day to make sure everything is included in your query. Um, for most queries using the REST API, um, if you include a row count of zero in the query, it'll give you a count of the records in the request, but not the records themselves. Um, so if you're not able to ingest loads of JSON formatted data, you can 
still do the basic troubleshooting just by comparing numbers. We found that uh, some people find that very useful. You can do some fairly specific filtered queries. So a, for example, if you register funding data with us, you can look up all DOIs with funder identifiers. Um, you can look up the number of records with funder identifiers and a funder name. You can look up the number of records with award numbers. This data will give you an idea of how effective your funding data is overall. It's also handy if you have vendors submitting this data for you and you want to keep an eye on them. So just some more examples. Um, you can see how many records have Crossmark data, how many records have license URLs, and how many of your records have at least one ORCID ID included in the metadata. Okay, um, we have a great question. Someone's asking if Crossref manually edits the metadata locally. Um, if an author gets in touch with us um, and requests a correction, we actually don't. Um, all of our, men, our metadata comes from our members. Uh, most often, that's a very good thing. Um, occasionally, with errors, um, if, if there's messy, messy metadata, it, it, it can be a bad thing. So we, we, you know, we'd like to edit these things, things ourselves, but it's, uh, um, you know, we basically collect the metadata and send it along. We don't touch it all, at all. We can, um, if you need help figuring out how to update something, we can absolutely do that for you. Um, but if, you know, any, any requests um, for corrections, we will reach out to you usually via email and um, the email to the technical contact we have on and file and request that you make that change. So we also have an XML API that can be very useful. You can look up the metadata you've registered for an item. Um, this query I have on the slide will show everything as you've registered with it with us, all of the metadata you've sent us. Um, we also have a tool called the Deposit Harvester. For those of you who are familiar with OAI PMH, it will retrieve all of your data in title-based sets, and that data will all be in XML. Um, and again, I have links to all of the mentioned tools at the end of the slides, so you've, if you want to learn any more about them, that information will be available when the slides are sent out, and if anything that needs clarification, you can always reach out to our support team. So here's an example of the type of record you get when you use the Deposit Harvester or the XML API. Um, Many of you will recognize it if you send us XML. It looks just like the XML you send in for deposits because that's pretty much what it is. We just put some wrapper tags around it and send it and send it back out to you when you ask for it. Um, so this is a good way of retrieving complete metadata. Um, if you've acquired content that has been registered by another member and you don't, you're not getting that metadata via another route, you can pull that down from us in somewhat deposit ready XML. Um, just a note, if you do acquire content from another member, if that content includes Crossref DOIs, um, you will be in charge of the metadata. You can re-register the metadata if you need to, but if the metadata is thorough and complete and correct, you really just need to update URLs if, or any metadata that's specific to the publisher, like any license or text and data mining license information. So, but you know, if you do opt to keep the already registered metadata, it's best to confirm that what you're responsible for, the metadata you're responsible for is good metadata. Um, so we do have some reports that help you with metadata issues. Some are sent by email, usually to the technical context we have for your organization. So if, if you've had some staff turnover, make sure you keep us up to date because this information we send you is important. Also, please review the emails we send to you. They usually, the reports usually come from reports at crossref.org. Sometimes our support staff will contact you from support at crossref.org. Um, these emails from our support staff are usually about metadata quality issues. About a third of the requests that come through our support team are related to metadata quality complaints. Um, metadata consumers report these problems one by one. Um, as I mentioned, we don't touch your metadata, so we do need to pass these reports along to you for ac action. Um, 
and our metadata is really, it's displayed everywhere. So even little tiny errors can have a huge impact on how an item is displayed and discovered. Um, I'm gonna go into a little bit more detail about a few of our reports, but not all of them. Um, just briefly, that we do have a title list on our website that allows you to look up your titles by ISSN or, um, or title. It, you can use it to look at your coverage information, which can be very illuminating. If you do nothing else, uh, journal publishers might want to scan the coverage listed to make sure you haven't missed any issues, or if you've registered content with the publication year of 2013, or not 2013, like 2032, you know, a year far in the future that doesn't exist. Um, we also have this titled data available as a CSV file if you want to interrogate it that way. Um, we send out Schematron reports every week. Um, they're, again, emailed to the technical content we contact we have for your organization, and they are very specific to metadata quality. These reports are used to identify messy metadata that you send to us. Um, we need to be very flexi flexible and accommodate variances in data. So our deposit schema can't keep out all of the questionable, questionable data without blocking good data. So we do a basic post-deposit review of the metadata you've sent us and pick out items that we think might be incorrect. Um, these are usually sent out Saturday night and we don't send a lot of them out, um, maybe 45 a week, which considering we have thousands of members isn't a lot, but it's a very effective tool. It's, it's kind of brought to the surface some recurring issues with some members, particularly with uh, author names if someone includes um, junior in the surname field or they're including nicknames in the surname field, that can really impact whether some an article is discovered because we'll see that full string as the author's surname um, and a citation will just use the actual surname. So, Earlier, I ran through some API queries you can use to get data on what you've been sending us. Um, we're planning to launch a report that will give you these details visually, so you can see what you're sending us without jumping through a bunch of ho hoops. We're calling these uh, participation reports for now and because they'll help to measure the impact of member participation. These are, it's still in the development stage, um, so, what you see here might change, but the basic idea is that you'll be able to pull up your data member by member and see many, how many DOIs you've registered and what data you have provided beyond the minimum required set. Um, you'll be able to see if you're sending us references, if your references are publicly available, if you're sending funding and license data, and if you're participating in Crossmark and how many of your records have been pro uh, populated with that data. Again, this is just a working version um, but the basic idea won't change. You'll be able to see the overall percentage of your records that contain each type of metadata, and you'll be able to um, drill down into that by journal title. And we hope to release that um, later this year. Okay, I have a question. Um, someone's updating uh, their journal. They're migrating to another um, platform or our website and their URLs are going to change and they want to know if they can send us the um, URLs by email. Yes, absolutely. You can just make a list of all your DOIs and URLs and put it in a CSV file or a text file and email it to support at crossref.org. Um, if you aren't sure what DOIs you've registered with us for some reason, you can always also contact support and ask for a list of your DOIs and your URLs and we can, we can send that to you and you can just, you know, double check and make sure what we have is what you think we have. <laughs> Never a bad idea. Yeah, so if you're, if you, um, just back to the participation reports, if you're interested in this and you want to learn more about it, uh, contact our support team and we can add us add you to our list of testers when we get to that stage. So if you do need help, we have lots of documentation um, at support.crossref.org. We also have a small but very capable support staff. 
Um, we give support mostly by email, but if you have a more a deeper problem you need to drill into, um, we can always set up a call um, and uh, walk through some problems that way. And again, here's the list of resources that will be sent out with the slides. Um, I've included a list, a link to a video of a talk given by Ian Calvert at our Live 16 event in 2016. So um, two years ago, it, it, it's a talk, it's about a half an hour and it focuses on metadata quality and he has a lot of fun with cross-ref metadata and data visualizations. So if you have some time, please um, watch that. And that is it. Thanks for joining our webinar. If you do have some questions, I'll uh, hang around and answer them via the, the chat, uh, the Q&A window, or feel free to uh, reach out to support at crossref.org if any questions pop into your head later on.